Brilliant. OK, again, uh, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the um, uh, to the Wisbeach High Street wallpaper um, talk. Um, this again, as anyone who's been to these talks before, you know that this is generously funded through the National Lottery Heritage Fund and delivered through uh, Fenland District Council's the Wisbeach High Street project. Um, I'll just put a uh, link to um, to their website in the chat. I mean, I think you may have found that already if you managed to get a um, get a ticket in here but I'll pop that in if you haven't um, because it's a wonderful website with lots of information about what's going on in the project as a whole rather than just these talks and there'll also be um, upcoming events about our upcoming talks as well. Um, so today um, this talk's going to be on the history of wallpaper so um, it'll run through the general history and then we'll also um, give uh, some examples of, uh, sort of how to date wallpaper and some of the wallpaper used currently in the UK. Um, we'll also look at some conservation issues as well uh, with historic wallpaper um, and what to do if you find historic wallpaper in your property and how to integrate these into future designs. Um, if you have any sort of questions as you go, pop them in the chat. Um, uh, Jamie Lee is uh, will be helping with that. Um, if you have any technical issues uh, at the moment, I'm I'm the only uh, one who can deal with those. But if you if you have any trouble, normally logging off and logging back in normally works pretty well. And try it on a different browser as well. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'll start with our with the main um, with the main talk. So um, wallpapers played a huge part in UK interior design since about the 1500s. Um, so I'm just going to give a quick sort of a overview about these uh, five centuries of wallpaper history in about sort of 15 to 20 minutes, um, and then we'll move on to uh, to sort of the, the conservation issues as well. Um, so although paper had been used to decorate the walls in, in China and Japan for hundreds of years, the history of European wallpaper really begins in the 16th century. Previously, British homes were decorated with tapestries and textiles. Um, these are both decorative and functional. So uh, tapestries provided warmth and insulation to a room and also helped to uh, prevent drafts as well. Um, however, tapestries are obviously extremely large scale. Uh, they're hand woven and you would have to sort of dye each fiber. So they were really only something that the, that the very wealthy could, could afford. Um, they're extremely expensive to produce. Um, however, um, the same patterns um, sort of started becoming replicated on paper, which is obviously a much cheaper option. Um, and this uh, paper version of, uh, of tapestries and wall painting started to become much more common. So uh, how would you actually make early wallpaper? So early wallpaper was made from rags beaten into a pulp um, that released individual fibres. Uh, these are normally cotton, but sometimes it could also be hemp or linen. Um, then this is mixed with water in a really large vat. Um, I think you can see the engraving on the left hand side. This is an engraving from 1821. Um, so a wire mesh called a decal uh, with a removable wooden frame called a mould is dipped into this vat and kind of shaken around. And as it's lifted out of the water, the fibres settle and form into a sheet of paper. So before 1750, the mesh was made of parallel chains of metal, which gives a sort of a um, uh, which give a lined look. So you can kind of see that a little bit um, in the image on the bottom right hand corner. So that's why sort of old paper has that kind of uh, lined effect. Um, it's the imprint from the from the decal. Um, so the paper was, uh, um, but in after the 1750s, the metal was woven together instead of just on bars. And this gives a kind of more even and flat look. Um, and this is called wove paper. So that's quite a good way of, of dating paper. If it hasn't got these horizontal lines, it's probably going to be after 1750. Obviously, sometimes these lines are now put in, um, are now put in for, for style and, and fashion. So they can come after 1750. Um, this is also how you get watermarks as well. So if you see in the sort of wiry picture and in the bottom centre, um, there's lettering that's put into this. So the same indents you get on the paper just from that also make indents in patterns. And that's how the watermark is made. The bit of paper that's over the raised area is ever so slightly thinner than the paper that settles in, in the hollows. And so that change in thickness of paper means that when you hold it up to the light, light comes through at a different level. 
So uh, what this paper was was laid down, um, it was dried and then sized. So that means that a glue, normally something gelatin based, was applied. And this gives it strength and also seals it so that the ink wouldn't bleed when you had stenciled onto it. So wallpaper was then normally printed using a wood block or a stencil technique. And uh, normally either a stemper paint or an oil based paint was used. So because of this technique, early wallpaper could only be produced in small sheets, sheets that would be able to fit onto one of these decals that could be done by hand. Um, and these would then be pasted together to form a length um, either before putting on the wall or after. So if we go back to the slide we just saw, you can see in this um, scenic paper that it's got lots of kind of a, it's separated into about sort of six pieces of paper here. So that's another really good way to see if you've got early wallpaper. If it's in big, long lengths, it's, uh, it's probably after a certain date. And if it's um, small amounts of paper, um, it will be after that, before that. So stylistically, the earliest wallpaper that found in the UK dates from 1509. And this is found covering some of the beams in the dining hall at Christ College, Cambridge. Um, so another early image comes from a private home, and this dates to around 1550. So really, really um, early papers. Um, as you can see, these still have a kind of sense of the same designs that we've seen in textile hang hangings and, and tapestries. Um, and it was actually as early as this that flock wallpaper um, was developed as a way to emulate damask um, wall coverings. Um, so it's not just a 1990s change of room thing. Flock wallpaper has been around for, for centuries and centuries. By the 18th century, the patterns that were used um, became gradually more stylized and also more vivid colors were introduced as well. So um, as we can see here, the colors don't look particularly um, vivid, but you can see that we've got um, more stars coming in and slightly more colors. But actually, if we just look at this um, top left hand corner, uh, um, the paper there. So even though that looks um, quite mild in its colors, this is just because of the pigments used. Um, so a red lake pigment was used, which fades really quickly in light. And if you look at a little bit where um, the border has come off, you can see just how bright and vivid this paper would have been all the way across. Um, so really, really almost garish um, wallpapers. And again, the, all these papers here are from the 18th century, even though they can look quite quite modern in terms of their, their colour and design. So another really good way to date wallpaper. Um, so because of the popularity of wallpaper, this led to a wallpaper tax, which was in place between 1712 and 1830, uh, 1836. So each individual sheet of wallpaper would have been stamped like this with a tank with a, with a tax stamp. Um, and again, this is a good way of dating wallpaper because we know it fits in, in between this area. But it also shows just how much wallpaper has moved on from being a cheap replica to a luxury in its own right. In the 18th century, wallpaper was either pasted directly onto the bare plaster wall or applied to a canvas and then stretched across wooden battens. Um, by the 19th century, canvas and batten hanging was much more popular as this created sort of a cleaner line and, and um, a kind of a smoother wall, and that became a bit more stylistically important. It was also around this time, sort of around the 1810s, that lining paper became popular. Um, this further helped to create a nice smooth surface. Um, even though specific lining paper was sold, more often than not, it was common to just recycle newspaper. Um, so again, it's wonderful when you find this because you have a nice date of when this wallpaper was uh, probably applied, applied from or at least after, um, and that makes our job much easier. So in terms of fashion, again, in the mid 18th century, chiwazerie was the, at the height of fashion and the old style of uh, wallpaper that was very heavy and wood blocked was replaced by um, by these papers and designs that are much more delicate um, and often hand painted in oriental scenes as well. So in the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, we saw a flux of uh, an influx of genuine paper that was um, produced in China, as well as some that was produced in China, but specifically for export to the Western markets. Um, Others in this style are produced more locally. So the UK and France were kind of the, the hotspots of wallpaper in, in the Western, in, um, in, in Western Europe, um, as well as uh, French perspective papers, um, which I'll show you in a second from, from Zuba. So uh, as you can see, these are, 
these have um, very sort of a hand painted feel to them. Um, and uh, and it was found as well that um, often you could have a, a sort of a black and white version of this or that all the outlines would be similar, but the actual colours you could use are different. So sometimes you can find uh, 18th century Chinoiserie really wallpapers that are um, have the same design, but just in slightly different colours, depending on when the artist at the other end decided to, to paint them. Also, it was quite common to um, to cut out elements of these paper and paste them back on. So you'll occasionally get sort of a few extra butterflies that are clearly kind of cut out and pasted on. Um, this can either be through, through an extra decorative thing or it can be to cover a scuff mark or a, or a nail hole or something like that. You might get an extra flower or an extra butterfly that's just there um, uh, as as sort of a as almost a conservation. Um, so this is um, a Chinwa's Ryu wallpaper that's actually been, well, sort of scenic wallpapers that's actually been printed. Um, so again, it takes along this uh, really uh, delicate and hand painted look and really complex designs that um, that came into the UK and the Western market um, from China, but depicting uh, different different scenes. So this is um, a an area from um, from the Zuba wallpaper, um, which was a French firm. It was designed in 1834 and um, it's entitled Views of North America. Um, and this particular one here um, was uh, actually in the 1960s, it was applied to, um, to the White House in their diplomatic room. Um, it's made from uh, uh, 1,619 antique wood blocks. So you can see just in the top right hand corner, someone actually wood blocking this by hand. So that kind of gives you an idea of the complexity of it. So even though it's not hand painted, it's still incredibly labour intensive and incredibly complex. Um, so obviously this was kind of valued for its uh, for its aesthetics, um, but also it has a bit of a deeper meaning as well. So if we look a bit closer at, at the main picture, again, this is in um, the diplomatic room in, in the White House and it's uh, views of North America. And it clearly shows uh, everyone from uh, lots of uh, different races and areas all getting along, having a lovely time, which obviously isn't exactly how things went down at, um, in 1834. So it kind of also can portray kind of like a, a sort of a political meaning or kind of be sort of almost like a fantasy as well. So, um, you know, wallpapers aren't just there for purely aesthetics. They can be used in almost like a political manner as well. So uh, we're moving slightly towards the 19th century now and the Industrial Revolution, uh, which saw obviously technological changes across all industries, but especially in wallpaper manufacturer manufacturing. So um, by the 1920s, paper could be produced in continuous rolls. So as if how we're used to buying wallpaper now on a big roll rather than just the small decal sheets. Um, and this is thanks to a, um, the invention of the machine of um, the Forderian machine in 1806. Um, around the 1840s as well, to meet this kind of high demand for affordable paper, wood pulp was added into the paper. Um, if we remember as well, around sort of the 1810s, wallpaper, uh, the wallpaper tax was um, was uh, taken away. So wallpaper was no longer taxed, so it became much cheaper. Um, and again, this coincided with the Industrial Revolution, which meant it was cheaper, easier to produce, and lots of people wanted it. So again, by um, putting wood pulp into the paper rather than just cotton, flax or linen, um, again, it made it much cheaper, but it also resulted in a poorer quality paper. And it's much more susceptible to deterioration, things like brittle and yellowing. Um, so when you see these really sort of like brittle, thin, yellowed paper, it's likely that these have wood pulp in them. And so they're probably from the 19th century onwards. Um, as well as uh, these developments in the paper side, you've also got huge developments in the pigment industry as well. So this allows for a multitude of new inexpensive colours um, and printing from a great engraved rollers also allowed for much more complex and elaborate designs. So you could get the elaborateness of Zuba scenic wallpapers that we've just seen, but off um, several rollers rather than being hand printed. So the same complexity with much lower labour. And again, things here are things like realistic florals, trompe l'oeil, architectural designs, scenes, and also um, novelty papers as well. Um, so here's some examples of, um, of these. And again, you've got really uh, complex papers. Um, you've got um, pillar and arch designs, which are very uh, um, uh, which are very common and popular around that area. And you've got um, some uh, um, uh, um, some Grecian forms as well. 
Um, however, this kind of a uh, revolution in in sort of vivid, vivid colours, you can see those yellows and those greens, as well as the complex design, they're incredibly um, popular with uh, the people buying the papers. Um, so really, really commercially uh, popular. But um, in terms of fashion, they were considered quite uh, gaudy and bad taste. So even characters in books at the time often have scenes where they overreact to bad wallpaper. Um, and uh, so we've got um, you've got the yellow wallpaper and you've got the house full of horrors as well. Um, and actually, uh, the wallpaper showing the Crystal Palace on the top right hand side, um, this was used um, to demonstrate a really bad wallpaper design um, in, in the book False Principles of Design. So this kind of uh, complete a uh, gaudiness of wallpaper led to a bit of a design reform and this abdicated that a, a flat surface should be fat should be flat so it shouldn't have all these scenic designs that make you feel like you're looking through a window or anything like that and not imitate a three-dimensional world um so unsurprisingly william morris papers really follow this rule and um, by the turn of the century bold woodcut style wallpapers were back in fashion so again harking back to those sort of original papers that we saw in in around sort of like the, the 18th century um, also, wallpaper friezes became more popular as well. You haven't just got a flat wall with um, with the whole design. You have more of a uh, tripartite scheme going on, potentially with a, a, a dado, a dado border, an upper wall, and a frieze as well. Sometimes, um, and so in the uh, by the turn of the century, the sort of the darker colours as well that you'll kind of see um, in some Victorian papers, these started to tend to go towards a bit more of a light colour as well. So you've got that kind of shift in colours as well going towards the 20th century. Um, also around uh, this time, around the Victorian uh, period, again, wallpaper was both um, now affordable, easy to get, available in lots of different colours, but it was also um, really hounded as, a, as essentially a, a, a good thing for health. Um, you had what was called sanitary paper, which you can see um, in the top left and, uh, and the, sort of the brown coloured one in the in the lower images. Um, and these were essentially papers that were then varnished, which meant that you could easily wipe them down. So again, it's nice and healthy that you can just wash these walls down. Similarly, um, wallpapers that weren't uh, paper so much, um, so things like um, Anagalipta and um, Lincrusta, these were also seen as very easy to wash and wipe down, so really, really healthy. Um, on the total flip side of that, um, you've got this kind of a movement suddenly realizing how terrible arsenic was and a lot of the um, really really vivid um, colors in wallpaper especially this green called shields green um, uh, have really really high levels of wallpaper and there was lots of reports of, um, of people becoming really sick and people dying because of wallpaper um, they even found in um, in Napoleon's room um, that he had wallpaper that contained arsenic Nick and this um, this uh, sort of uh, was the idea that the British had poisoned him through his wallpaper, even though that's not quite what happened. Um, so you've kind of got this balance of wallpapers being both really good for the health movement and also really bad for them as well. Um, so the interwall uh, wallpaper, so modernist movements of the 30s kind of rejected pattern um, and advocated for sort of more flatter, simple designs um, but as well as this you also have the second the outbreak of the second world war and this kind of halted the growth of the wallpaper industry because the factories and materials were needed for, for other things so this is a bit of a kind of decline in in um, in wallpaper history here um, however by the 1950s uh, wallpaper was seen um, as a kind of a cheap and effective method of decoration and this is particularly due to the elements in machine printing in the late 1940s and also styles varied wildly and catered for all tastes and all budgets. So you can have traditional motifs such as floral designs um, uh, which uh, you know can be either quite similar to 18th century ones or just updated slightly for a more sort of modern audience um, and again uh, some uh, some 1950s wallpaper is indistinguishable from the 1930s papers, so that kind of kept that going. But also you've got kind of very 50s themes, you've got this kind of like atom look as well. And also there was a big drive in the wallpaper industry to collaborate with leading artists as well. Um, and screen printed designs led to sort of modern full, uh, bold wallpapers, which tended to be used on, on feature walls rather than all over. So wallpaper was seen as a kind of um, semi decorative feature semi-artwork. 
in the 1960s as well, we have a whole new generation of, of wallpaper. Um, and again, this was partly due to um, technology. So we have strippable and ready pasted wallpaper, which is perfect for the, for the DIY generation and vinyl wall coverings as well. Um, traditional wool fibers that were used in flock wallpapers were replaced for acrylic. So again, much easier and cheaper to, um, uh, to, to use. Um, and additional textures such as corked paper and metallic foil paper being used. So you've got this real playfulness with materials rather than it just being sort of a um, paint printed onto, onto paper. Um, patterns were also influenced by the pop and op art movements and aimed to entice a youthful audience. It was really aimed sort of not so much like your grandma's kitchen, it's aimed at kind of a youthful, exciting thing. And in the 1970s as well, the kind of the trend for vinyl and metallic papers um, and advocation for big, bright flat prints uh, continued as well. Um, however, in the 1980s, we have a complete contrast. Um, we saw a return to sort of delicate floral and sort of trellis wallpapers, which matched the fabrics as well, um, which was a style capitalised on by companies such as Laura Ashley, which would often have um, fabrics and papers um, that matched as well. So you could have everything matching. Um, and again, you've got um, the color scheme is much more muted and you've got traditional patterns come in. So retrospective trends like this often make it difficult to identify wallpaper from patterns alone. So other contextual clues such as um, finding a paper beneath fixtures or furniture um, that we know are from a certain date or assume are from a certain date, or beneath papers that are more kind of of their time or kind of obviously dated or datable. Um, and so uh, the wallpaper can be either a lot earlier than you think or a lot later than you think. Um, you can't always just go off the pattern alone. Also the material that it's made of and the, and the um, length of paper as well. Um, and then uh, now looking into the, the 21st century as well, we have had a massive wallpaper revival. So again, as instead of it being seen something that's a bit kind of like um, a bit kind of fusty and old, um, really big, bright patterns are coming back. And again, this is drawing on um, traditional um, aesthetics. Again, like the chinoiserie papers are really popular again, um, or sort of big florals that are almost kind of 1930-ish. Um, or again, we've got sort of like earlier ones that mimic sort of 18th century fabrics. Um, but we also have really modern ones as well. So things like marbling or big flamingos, it's much more, much more bold, bold and again, much more variety. Um, so now I'm going to have a little interactive bit if people want to turn on their, their cameras or mics or just pop in the chat. Um, so just to kind of show you some of the difficulties in dating wallpaper. Um, where, what sort of date do we think this nicer glittery wallpaper is from? From either the 1890s, 1920s or 1990s. So you can either shout out or pop it or pop it in the chat. Surprisingly difficult. 1890s. Hey, we've got a vote for 1890s. Anyone else want to do any put any votes anywhere else? 1920s. <laughs> 1920s, yeah. <laughs> 1920s. 1990s. 1990s, 1920s. Anyone else before I do the big reveal? Go, okay, have a look. So um, uh, you were actually right with the 1890s. Uh, so this is the Iberian design, uh, which is part of the Westminster wallpaper collection um, that was done by Essex and Co. in uh, 1898. So this kind of like glittery, shiny thing, which we normally kind of think might be a little bit more kind of like 2000s, 90s. They're kind of mica pigments. Um, which give it that kind of almost glittery effect. And again, it's kind of very diff different from what we we think of when we think late Victorian wallpaper. We'll think something, we'll immediately go to sort of like Pugin or Morris, something like that, rather than this quite realistic floral with a glittery background. Um, so again, very, very easy to, um, to be sort of fooled by this one. Another one is this, um, this lion here in this sort of woodblock style. So are we thinking, 1620s, 1950s, or 2010s? A googly. <laughs> so, well, it looks and, like 1620s to me, but I, I suspect it's probably the other end. <laughs> 1620s, anyone else for any more? 1950s. 1950s? I'll go 1620s as well. Lovely. Um, right, yeah, even though it was uh, 
in a, a woodbox style. This is actually from the 1950s. Again, not what you would think about for a 1950s wallpaper at all. Um, just not the style that we think of when we think of 1950s wallpaper. Uh, this is called Sicilian Lion, and um, this is from a collection called the Palladio Collection, um, which is, again, it was a really, really big push to get artists and designers um, to create big, bold wallpapers. And these are normally marketed at architects who would put them in sort of like restaurants or big public spaces or walls that would take these kind of big, bold designs. Um, but yeah, this is from 1957. So again, visually doesn't look anything like what you imagine a 1950 wallpaper is but there we go um and the last one as well this kind of um light blue floral one is this a 1740s 1860s or 1990s paper <laughs> reissued every time <laughs> original from <laughs> 1990s 1990s yeah another not 1990s uh, yeah, you'd be right with that one. Uh, this is a classic Laura Ashley one um, called Wild Clematis, which is from 1993. Um, but again, uh, equally, that sort of pattern wouldn't be a miss in, in the 1740s or 1860s either. So we kind of have to, again, go with those contextual clues and just sending a photo of a piece of wallpaper to a wallpaper historian and go, when's this from? unless it's a pattern that you kind of recognize or it's something very of its time we need these these other clues to kind of give us a bit of a hand as well um, and also not to just write off paper if it looks like it's really kind of modern and, and, and sort of bright colored and you're like there's no way that could be historic sometimes it can surprise you and, and be older than you think it is um, so speaking of when you find wallpaper, we'll look a bit more now at the actual um, conservation issues that we have when we when we come across wallpaper. Um, so uh, we've got um, things like uh, physical. Um, so that's uh, things like physical damage. Um, so, for instance, if you have a door with a doorknob and the doorknob smashes into the wall and you get that nice little hole in the wallpaper every time or someone brushes across it with a chair. Um, Theft vandalism. Again, obviously, theft is a little bit more difficult on wallpaper um, unless it's unless it's in canvas. But vandalism is is a, very, is a big threat to wallpaper. Again, anyone with a pen who's just doodling near a wall. Um, water again. So that can be um, that can be condensation. That can be sort of like a glass of water spilling or it could be something like a leak from from a ceiling. Um, a lot of the pigments that we have um, are, um, are water soluble. Um, biological. So we're talking about mold pollutants and off-gassing, um, so especially from the wood and the paper. I'll run through these in more detail as we go along, I'm just introducing them. Uh, light again, like we saw before, the light pigments can fade in light. Temperature as well, a little bit less so, but mainly because that affects humidity, which is a big thing for wallpaper. And lastly, custodial neglect. So we'll just look at these in a little bit more detail. So um, here we've got kind of a, a good example of having sort of physical water and biological damage here. So um, we've got obviously this physical tear here. This is kind of we're looking at a corner and on the right hand side down this wall, there'd been a big leak in the in the ceiling and this had gone through down to the wallpaper. And so on here, the water is both kind of um, stained the paper. So you can see this big brown stain line. So any dirt that's been around has kind of been sucked into the paper and left these big tide lines um, and they're extremely difficult to get out um, without sort of severely damaging the paper. Um, you've also got mould that's gone on the paper as well. Wallpaper is brilliant for mould because you've essentially um, got a perfect food source there. So you've got both the, um, the adhesive that it's gone up with, which is normally a starch paste. Um, so kind of like a, a like a, a You've got sort of you know vegetable stuff there and then you've also got the actual paper as well which again is normally this sort of like it's still plant-based um so and you're normally sort of inside in a kind of relatively warm environment um so you've got kind of the perfect breeding ground there as well and then this physical tear here that's actually just come from the wallpaper um uh, stretching and moving across the wall um either because the wall has slightly shifted um, or because the paper has slightly slightly shifted there. So obviously if you've got a join and then the paper can't stretch, but the walls do move, then you've got ripping going on in these corners here. So then again, that's something that can just kind of develop. Excuse me, Philip, um, my picture's not moved. Oh, it has now. Oh, thank you. Okay, um, you should be able to see one now that's talking about light. And we've got kind of that. Yes, it's, it's got that now. now, yes. 
Lovely. Um, yeah, so again, like we had a little look before on some of the earlier slides, um, we've got the light is, a, again, a massive, massive issue for, for wallpaper, especially historic wallpaper. Um, less so with modern because we have um, uh, pigments and dyes which are, you know, we've developed to be much more kind of um, uh, less light sensitive. Um, but historic pigments are very light fugitive, um, especially the ones used in wallpaper. So this is where you can get this massive fading. So again, if you find historic wallpaper, especially if it's been covered up um, sort of over the centuries, it's great to um, just kind of either um, leave it in sort of like a, a fold up of, of, um, of other paper or with something on on top of it just so that the light can't get to it or sort of put it in, in a dark place away from sort of direct daylight. Um, or if you're um, storing it or, or wanting to display it, make sure that um, you have kind of a, a, a UV filtered glass over it or something along those lines to protect it from light because that can be really damaging surprisingly quickly. Um, and again, here we've got a bit of a biological damage again. So we've got some got some moulds, um, uh, pollutants and um, off gassing. So here again, this is a paper from around around sort of the, the turn of the century. So sort of around sort of 1901 ish. Um, and again, so this is when uh, uh, wallpaper will have had um, a lot of wood pulp in it and um, wood releases an acid, which um, essentially is self-destructive. Um, so uh, so the kind of the more it, um, it off gas, the more it uh, disintegrates and it becomes really, really brittle um, and humidity as well. So um, it was on a external wall um, and so the moisture and condensation from there um, that actually kind of uh, broke down the adhesive. Uh, which made the wallpaper kind of fail off from the wall. So you've got it being really, really brittle and not being able to hold itself together. And because the adhesive has broken down, it can't be held up by the wall either. So that's why it's all collapsing into itself. And also custodial neglect. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, that's that. Um, and also custodial neglect as well. Um, and this was because this wallpaper was behind panelling um, in a domestic house and no one knew it was there until the panelling was removed when it was being restored. So it was just, um, it was, uh, so it's kind of also um, uh, degraded just purely because no one was there to look after it or, um, or, or do any sort of conservation measures towards it because it, nobody knew it was there. Um, again, theft va vandalism as well, and uh, and a well custodian neglect. So this is wallpaper that was um, that's in sort of the the top floor of um, of a house. Again, one that was used as a shop on the bottom floor, and all of the upper floors were just kind of used for storage rather than living in. So you've got no one there again stopping people from writing on the walls, and now you have kind of people just going up in the storeroom, not sort of realizing this is kind of quite valuable wallpaper um, and kind of doodling all over it. So you've kind of got the both there. And again, this is in a sort of pen that you just can't remove from that wallpaper without damaging the wallpaper. So it's sort of irreversible damage there. Um, but again, sometimes um, graffiti can't be all bad. <laughs> Vandalism isn't all bad um, uh, because uh, sometimes it again helps us either date or people kind of leave uh, things that are quite useful for the history of the house on them as well. Um, so again, we can see that um, a tenant lived here from uh, for you know uh, for a day okay. in the 1960s. Um, um, so sometimes uh, sometimes vandalism is is good. <laughs> Um, so what do you actually do then if you find historic wallpaper in your house um, or on a project that you're working on? So again, the first thing to do is really photo, photograph it and document it. Um, and again, if you're if the property you're working on is listed, um, you might need to um, notify the conservation officer, depending on if the interior is part of the listing or not. Because if you find kind of significant historic wallpaper, that might um, then throw up problems later and you might need to ask for um, more sort of listed building consent. But again, that sometimes it's nothing, sometimes it is, but it's always best to kind of like check anyway, if you think it's of sort of some significance and some age. Uh, the second one is just be aware of hazardous pigments. Again, uh, we saw there was just loads of um, arsenic or potentially mercury or lead in these wallpapers. And this is a bit different from when it's in paint. When you've got hazardous materials in paint, it's only sort of dangerous when it becomes airborne. And, you know, paint is quite good at sticking itself to the wall. Whereas a lot of the pigments on wallpaper aren't as well bound to the surface. So if you brush over it, you might get sort of like just the, the pattern that brushes up on your hands. And so if you then sort of like 
brush your hand against the arsenic wallpaper and then go and eat a sandwich you're just giving yourself arsenic poisoning so just be a little bit aware of that and as well any sort of dust that comes off or, or any sort of dusting that you do around or near it you just want to be a little a little bit cautious about that as well before you start just handling it um, yourself um, any fragments that have come loose that have come off the wall um, store them nice and flat and um, you know kind of have the cereal rule where you keep them in sort of uh, uh, away from away from damp areas and out of direct sunlight as well um, and then provide if it's still up on the wall provide either a temporary or permanent cover so this could literally be as easy as putting a, a sheet of plastic over it with a note on saying historic wallpaper like you know, beware or, or something like that. Um, or if it's something more permanent, maybe you might want to sort of a, a, um, a frame it or have kind of a, a sort of a more kind of permanent opening um, in the wall um, or have it have it conserved as well. Um, and also contact a conservator or a wallpaper historian if you're not sure if it's old or not, or if you did actually want to integrate this in a project or remove it. Again, this depends completely on um, uh, the level of significance of the wallpaper and the significance of the property and what you're going to use it for. Um, but, um, but the more knowledge you have about it, um, the more knowledge you can, the more things you can do with. Um, so now we'll just look at a few conservation options that there that there are. Again, obviously, every with conservation, every single um, uh, project and situation is unique. So the answer we always give is it depends. But very generally, um, here's, uh, there's kind of two main options. You either got in situ conservation or you've got the removal and um, off site conservation as well. So here's an example of some very um, basic in situ conservation. So um, this is some wallpaper that's um, that had uh, um, torn and you've got two flaps here. Again, the idea of this property was kind of uh, conserve as found. So they didn't want things to kind of go back to looking perfect. They kind of wanted to look kind of like disheveled as, as old and things like that. But when you've got bits of flaps of wallpaper <laughs> on, um, the likelihood of them getting caught and ripped and ripping off more is quite high. So what we did here is just tab these back to the wall, just adhere those flaps back to the wall um, and do nothing more with it. So all it was was making sure it didn't get more damaged. So that's probably kind of like the easiest, the most offhand um, sort of level of conservation that, that we do. Um, again, here as well, where you've got um, big sort of tears and cracks, we can also just face these up with some uh, with some tissue as well, just to kind of stop them um, stop them tearing anymore and stopping kind of like um, dirt and dust or anything going into those cracks and causing kind of um, staining throughout that wallpaper as well. So again, that's quite a low level of, of conservation. And again, you've got cleaning as well. Um, wallpapers are normally pretty you know, dirty, especially if they've been hidden over or behind things. Um, so cleaning them up can kind of really, really revive them. So that's just kind of some basic low level in situ conservation. Um, you then uh, got some more extreme ones. So this is wallpaper that had all kind of um, come come down in lots of um, in lots of uh, different sort of layers. So we we're kind of re-adhering the layers back up as well um, and just kind of like attacking them back so they'd be all fine around the edges, but they could also, you know, eventually, eventually be separated as well. But um, getting everything back on, back on the wall as well. Um, and then you have kind of um, bigger kind of uh, actual repairs and restoration as well. So this is a lincruster paper. Um, uh, so that kind of like embossed, um, uh, it's kind of a linseed oil mix type thing. Um, uh, so you can see there's a missing section here. So we took a mold of that and um, and here's a section of uh, Joe, one of our um, conservators who's working on the project. We've taken a mold of it and then we fill it with a um, specific um, sort of repair mix. Um, and then that um, can be um, trimmed to size um, and fitted into the right to the right area. Um, again, this was all going to be painted in a different uh, colour anyway, so we didn't need to touch in to make it the same colour because both the um, original one and the new repair were going to get paint over painted anyway. Um, and that was um, the point of Lincroster as well. Lincroster is always supposed to sort of be, be painted as well, um, so the colour match wasn't uh, wasn't sort of necessary. Uh, we've then got some removal and off-site conservation as well. So uh, this is that um, the paper that we just looked at a while ago that had kind of completely degraded, had uh, come away from the wall and was all kind of crumpling into itself. 
So um, there was no real kind of like practical way to get this back on the wall. Also, the property was going to be um, used as a holiday home. So it was going to be practically used in kind of the it, it was, had a high potential to be, to be damaged. So any conservation we did on situ would probably get undone eventually. And it was a very small amount that was in really poor condition. So what happened was the um, fragments um, were sort of all, all saved and uh, anything remaining on the wall, we kind of uh, carefully, carefully took off um, from those areas that were behind the panels. There was also some from the panelling we didn't remove, which was all sort of kept there. Um, and then we um, and then we can either just kind of um, clean them and store them or we can actually then um, uh, uh, then kind of recreate that paper, which again I'll show you in in a little in a little time. Um, but again, this can be almost stored as a museum object, essentially, so it can just kind of be filed away and archived. Um, so this is especially good as if you don't actually want the wallpaper on site or in in your house there at all, but you but it needs keeping. Um, and again, this is some example of um, of some of our students working on some wallpaper as well. So um, again, if you have big sort of like thick laminates of lots of different wallpaper, you can kind of um, start separating these and seeing all of the different types of wallpaper that's that are there rather than just the top layer. So that's quite useful and interesting if you want to look at it from more of a kind of a, a kind of a historic perspective and understanding the decorative history of the building. You can separate these papers out, um, which is much, much easier to do um, off site than it is than it is on site. And again, sometimes that's appropriate, sometimes it's not. It completely depends on the size, scale, context, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and again, then, so how would you actually integrate this into into a project? If um, if you kind of if you're going to get it conserved, how would you necessarily integrate this paper in? Um, so again, some is just recording and research. Some is framing and rehanging, and as well, um, in sort of more extreme cases, you can do replication. Um, so uh, I really hope this video will work. Um, yeah, so uh, this is some fragments of wallpaper that we'd um, restored and scanned. So we only had like a very few fragments here, but um, uh, the property we're working with wanted to understand what this would look like um, more thoroughly. So we've kind of stitched these fragments back together and then kind of um, digitally painted over them. Um, and eventually we've kind of managed to grab that design and recreate that um, to see how it would look kind of as an original paper. Um, and again, this was all done digitally, so this wasn't printed out or anything. It was just to kind of understand what this paper would have looked like when, when it was first there. Um, and this can also be done on the wall as well. So the one we just saw was one done from fragments that have been taken down, but it can also happen on the wall as well. So um, this was, um, uh, um, this was one again in the, in the same uh, property that was from about, uh, 1906. So again, uh, bits were traced on the wall. Again, we only had fragments, um, but we found those fragments and managed to find the repeat and kind of could digitally replicate it so we could see what the pattern kind of looked like. Um, and uh, and then kind of like changed the colour to what we thought the colour was. Again, it was really dirty there, but we could find a few clean areas. And so kind of from sort of this look, we ended up with this wallpaper. Um, and that kind of gives us an idea of kind of what sort of style it is. Again, where we found it gives an idea of context, but we can also now use this image to look for archival records. And we actually managed to find an archival record that matched this paper. Again, you can see in lots of different colorways in a green, a, a red and a blue. And these are from the Westminster wallpapers. Um, and again, uh, dated to sort of pre-1899. Um, so that can be really, really helpful as well. And sometimes that's as much as you need to do. You don't have to bring that design or anything like that into the property. It can just simply be there for historic research and, and interest. And you don't have to take it any, any further at all. Um, sometimes as well, you can have something that's sort of reframing and hanging. So um, this was some wallpaper in another property that was really, really damaged. Um, unfortunately, I only went on site before when they'd only just cut the hole and I haven't got a picture of it finally framed. But their idea was they were going to um, completely stud out the rest of the wall and the rest of the wallpaper was in such a sort of, you know, bad condition. You didn't really they didn't really want that as the kind of final finish, but they were just kind of going to keep a little sort of like um, open hole there. One again to help ventilation move around um, and they were going to cover that with with UV glass as well. And just to kind of also remind people that there was a historic wallpaper behind there. So if someone went in and say 50 years time or something, they'd know not to just kind of go knocking like 
massive holes through there and potentially damage the wallpaper that's that's behind. So that's quite a good reversible when when you kind of want to have a, a hybrid between just covering it up and ignoring, but also kind of wanting to bring a tiny bit of it in or kind of show that there is a historic feature to here, but not have that necessarily be the entire thing of the room. Um, sometimes it's a bit more complicated than that. So this was in um, a uh, a project we worked on in Snowdonia. Um, it's a farm there called Iriskern. Um, and uh, in the kind of um, in the sort of living room ish area, it's called the Keggin, uh, there was a barometer on the wall. Um, and uh, initially um, the barometer had been taken off, the wallpaper had been put on, but at some time, at some point, they just got bored of taking the barometer off. So you can see that the wallpaper has actually just been cut around the barometer. And if you can see on the right hand side, the sort of shadow of the barometer where you've got these kind of the layers where at first it was fully wallpapered underneath and then it was kind of tucked behind and then it was cut around. Um, so all this wallpaper had to come off the walls because the walls were in really, really poor condition um, and they needed fixing. So the wallpaper had to come off, but they really wanted to keep this this story because it's such a lovely little sort of, a, sort of human thing to see. And it really kind of brings the fact that people were living here into uh, to life. Um, and so what we did is we just conserved this area of wallpaper, consolidated it all and framed it. And now it's kind of an object in their welcome centre. So this is actually what the um, what the Kagan looked like. And again, if you see from here, there's lots of um, there's lots of buildup of wallpaper on the wall. Um, and we found a section of wallpaper that had um, all of the bits of wallpaper on it. Um, so this is just a kind of a cross section of the chunk of wallpaper. So you can see how many layers we're dealing with. Um, also, there's some like nice little mouse droppings there. We've got some like dust. We've got a lot of stuff going on. Um, but we managed to kind of uh, separate out these sections and have a look at um, um, all of the wallpapers there. So this is just a kind of small selection of some of those some of those wallpapers. Um, so you can see they're kind of you can kind of see a bit of development of the style. You can see that people quite liked having the, the kind of like the floral aspect to it, but it also kind of changes a bit with the as as sort of time goes on as well. It becomes a bit more kind of stylistic as as we move. Um, and interestingly as well, these were all crown wallpapers as well. And the same family lived in this house from when it was built to literally 2012 when it was taken over by Snowdonia National Trust. So it's a kind of a real family history and family story going on as well. But again, because we found out that they were all crown wallpapers and some of them had their salvage edges on as well, which is the little bit where the printer marks all the colours and the pattern number. Um, and that means that you can, if you have um, archives, then you can date them quite accurately. Or at least you can kind of date to when they were made. They might have been sold, say, 10 years later or five years later or something like that. Um, but at least you kind of have a ballpark date. Um, and with this property, they were um, they weren't sure where they wanted to take it back to. Um, it was the um, place where Hedwin, who is a famous uh, Welsh national poet who died in um, in the Battle of Passchendaele um, in the First World War. Um, so they were thinking potentially take it back to there or is it something they wanted to tell the story of the family across or or leave it as it was. Um, but they actually ended up really liking one of the wallpapers down here and it turned out after we kind of uh, uh, dated it with the salvage edges that this would have actually been um, the last wallpaper that would have been on the house when um, uh, when Hedwin uh, left to go to the war. So they thought that was quite one, both very visually nice and two, um, kind of it helped make their decision of when they were going to take this property back to. Um, so uh, we worked with a company called Bruce's Fine Papers um, to help replicate this. So on the left is the original wallpaper and on the right hand side is um, the replication. Um, and we made the decision to go with an original wood block design. So new wood blocks were cut out in the sort of amount of colourways. I think there were six, six or seven colourways. So six or seven blocks, each with a different um, colour on them um, uh, and had it all uh, uh, replicated by woodblock. You can do it digitally as well, but woodblocking gives it a different texture, it gives it a different feel, it makes it feel more authentic. So um, I always, again, unless it's a really complicated design, which means it's just completely financially unviable to, to replicate it, if it's possible to replicate it um, uh, through through uh, woodblocking, um, then it's, then I think that's definitely the best way to go. Um, and this is what it looks like with the wallpaper rehung there. So again, it kind of, even though this looks extremely busy when you look at it there, when you kind of put it in the context, it kind of fits um, and it has a really kind of like homely feel to it. And it's just really nice that we know that um, because we definitely couldn't keep the wallpaper on the wall 
anyway, just for conservation reasons. Um, it's really nice that a, a paper um, went back and kept that kind of like authentic feel there. Um, so those are a few, uh, I hope you've got kind of a good overview of some ideas of, of, of how wallpaper can be uh, taken in. Again, sometimes you can go to the massive extreme of replicating it and sometimes it's literally just, you know, you find you find a fragment and, you know, store it away and that's it. Um, there's, uh, again, wallpaper is still a very niche subject, <laughs> um, which I don't think it should be. It should be uh, really, really celebrated because it's such a kind of a, a an instant gratification thing. You know, every time you look at a piece of wallpaper, you don't kind of have to reimagine it. You can see it, how it's there. And it's literally when you're finding historic wallpaper, you could have been the first person to have seen that pattern for, you know, 400 years or something like that, um, which is really exciting. But there's some really, really good books. Um, written on wallpaper, which are down the side here. Um, archives, there's some really good um, visual archives in the v and uh, MODA, so Museum of Domestic Design and Architecture, and the Jeffrey Museum. So again, if you want a, just a kind of like a, a quick, oh, what kind of, what does this pattern look like? Um, how can I sort of ish date it from the pattern? Again, we know we need to be cautious for that, but um, those archives, which are all online, um, some bits aren't, some don't all have, they're not all digitized, but you've got a really good online bits there that you can kind of flick through and get a bit of a ballpark idea. Um, and then there's some uh, good organisations as well, which can give you advice um, along with us at Link Conservation as well. Um, so, yeah, we've got about just under 10 minutes. So if anyone has any questions at all, let me know either just sort of um, uh, speak up, unmute yourself or pop it in the chat. If no one's going to speak, can I speak? Absolutely. <laughs> um, hi, uh, absolutely fascinating. I absolutely um, love wallpapers and uh, it, it's uh, been a very interesting talk. I was interested whether any of the examples you gave um, came from Wisbeach um, because uh, my, my, my interest, I've been a, an estate agent um, and amongst other things for the last 45 years in Wisbeach and most of the historic properties of the town I've been into um, and I can remember several that had, um, up to, uh, after the dado, they had um, this what looked like hessian to me, hanging between um, uh, wooden strips attached to the wall. Um, mm. And then uh, over the years, it had all sagged and there was these sort of saggy um, loads. And of course, the first thing that any developer wants to do is to get them out a bit sharpish in case somebody like you comes along um, and sees it and then they've yeah. got to spend tens of thousands of pounds um, you know having them conserved and all the rest of it and it's one of the sadnesses uh, I've been involved I've been chairman of the Wisbeach Society and I'm chairman of Wisbeach Museum and it's one of the sadnesses with conservation that instead of people wanting to come and tell you um, all we do now is try to hide everything because we're terrified of what it might cost and the delays that it might put on the development and I'm just wondering if there's anything that can be done um to, to 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 stop that because in all i mean i have a medieval house and i completely rebuilt it 20 years ago um and and it was a nightmare i had busloads of con conservation people coming none of whom could agree with each other on what to do and i left it to them in the end but i'm just interested you know how you feel we can save some of this paper with that in mind well i think again when it comes to wallpaper and things like that it's always a balance between its significance and what's practical as well. And so I think, I think again, when you get conservators in, we'll give you a range of options. And I think that's the most important thing is to be like, this is if we were doing it and had unlimited money, this is what we would love to do. Um, but also let's look at other options that is better than just ripping it all away. So again, whether that is just saving a small amount that um so wallpaper has what's called a repeat um, and that's where the pattern repeats so even if it's something like okay this isn't practical to be here it's, it's not going to happen but the alternative is um it's just going to completely disappear so maybe at that point it's something where you're like oh well let's have an option of just going in and saving a repeat and maybe recording that. Um, again, either giving that to um, to Woods Beach Museum to look after or sort of another sort of, um, uh, sort of wallpaper archive to look after. Again, wallpapers, 
we're, apart from being sort of like the really fancy like William Morris ones or really kind of expensive ones, the day-to-day -day wallpapers just haven't really been appreciated for so long. So there's not really a setup for them. But eventually, the more that disappear, the more valuable they're going to get. So if anything, it's kind of in the long run, it's in your own worst interest to just completely get rid of them because every time you get rid of one, that makes the next one more valuable because it becomes rarer. Indeed, um, I'm an entrepreneur. That's I mean, that's that's how I make my living. <laughs> so um, even if it's something in terms of saying it's important, it's just not practical. Oh, that's really beautiful. Yes, um, can yeah, can so you identify that? That's my second question. Uh, I can see it in a very small bit, but I don't know, maybe like. Um, well, I just thought it was interesting because this is what the National Trust used to re-wallpaper the um, library in Peckover House um, oh, 25 wow, years amazing. ago. Uh, yeah. And I stole a, a little piece and I've, mm. lost the, I've lost the piece that tells me what it was called, but I presume it's a reproduction of a 19th century paper. I, I mean, it know. looks quite heavy when you unfolded it, so it either has a lining paper attached to it as well or it's kind of a bit, yeah, a bit I mean, heavier. It's, it, it, it was made specially um, for the National Trust, um, and it's. Uh, it, but I mean, I, I, I have a small collection mm. of, of bits of, of uh, wallpaper, and uh, I mean, I find them absolutely fascinating. But uh, it must be a wonderful job. I, I envy anybody with a job like that. It's a bit like uh, um, Howard Carter and Tutankhamun. As you strip bits off, you don't know what's going to come next. Um, but uh, no, exactly. fantastic. And you're always surprised. But I think that's, I think it's, again, sometimes if it's like an all or nothing approach, it's always, it's always just like, okay, well, we, we don't, we can't have all and we don't want nothing. So let's find some sort of middle ground. And, you know, that middle ground might just be like exactly what you've done. Keep, keeping a fragment, you know, recording it. Um, also helps as well if you take kind of like a nice big context photo as well so you can kind of see where it was and just kind of get more into the the habit of, of recording these as well um and again like um uh if it's if it's obviously a really huge repeat that might be a bit more difficult to store but you know as long as they're sort of small enough to fit into sort of like the um you know those kind of big a1 plan chests, that's quite a good way to keep them um sandwiched between uh it's called melanex it's a bit like a um conservation kind of acetate type thing um which can like seal it in nicely and then they're all away in the dark and it can be quite sort of an, an easy way of, of storing them and recording them so again if, if it's something where conservation isn't isn't viable either for you know practical reasons the end use of the property or financial reasons you know whatever or just the fact that hey this wallpaper actually isn't that significant but it's also kind of cool as well um or like or like you and me where you're just if you're just wallpaper dorks and you just really like keeping them um then you know just having having something that's just records you know physically records or repeat can be it can be a really good compromise the, the uh, pack over house wallpaper was uh printed from the original blocks by coal wallpaper merchants um, and they used an old oil painting or watercolor that was of the peckovers turn of the um, 20th century and they used that and Coles had the original blocks so um, it was easier. I think it was £70 a drop. Good lord, well my bit's probably worth about 20 quid then. <laughs> Something like that yeah when the drop they're about I think it was about 20 odd foot tall each the wall um, for each strip so you know it was quite expensive I think it worked out about £7,000 or wow. something to, to do the library. Yeah, I have Cole's um, hummingbirds on my wall in my main room. I love that uh, paper. But uh, who is that speaking? Uh, sorry, it's Bev. Bev Bishop. Oh, right, Bev. Well, thank you for that information. I'm, I've written that down. I'll keep that with my Wisbeach collection. <laughs> thank you so much. Again, as well, um, when you're like, you know, talking about the kind of like expensive of, of wallpaper when it's done like that, but you're kind of you're not just uh, creating a random wallpaper. What you're doing is you're kind of like you're keeping that knowledge of how to uh, wood pop print alive and you're kind of keeping that that print alive as well. So you're kind of not just paying for the for the kind of actual wallpaper when you're like, oh, I can get that down being cute. You're paying for the, the kind of like the, the research and the thought and the technology and the, and the history behind it as well. So it's it's kind of like a. Yeah, like bringing the object back to life, um, which is really cool. And Richard, as well, if you have any images of them, like I'd be really interested to to see them and, and paint them up because again, it's it's so difficult to find um, like photos and images and examples of just kind of like everyday wallpaper that you find in domestic properties. Just you know, because 
they just weren't kept. So um, if yeah, if I'd, I'd love to kind of get in contact and uh, see if I can uh, have a have a little look through your personal archives, if that's okay. Absolutely, yeah, no problem. Uh, but sorry, Mike, I think I asked a question. I can't remember. I probably talked over you. I apologise. But have you found anything exciting in the wallpaper world in Wisbeach? Um, I haven't actually found any Wisbeach examples just because I haven't been on any uh, Wisbeach projects. All right, um, I'm so sorry, I didn't realise that. Right. Uh, so I will, I've, um, as in like specifically wallpaper ones, I've been on some sort of other building ones, but none that's, that's involved that's involved wallpaper. Um, yeah, which is why I'd love to have a, a poke around yours and see. Have you, what, no, have you found any that are particularly exciting? Um, well, I, I mean, the trouble is I'm just an amateur and I, I, because I'm a farmer, I have lots of sheds, so I tend to collect loads of stuff. Um, and so, um, you know, I never throw anything away. And uh, I spent a lot of my time rootling in skips. And it's amazing uh, what comes out. Um, and uh, I'm getting old and senior and a bit half-witted now. So uh, my wife wants me to do something with all this stuff. But mm -hmm. it's, um, you know, it, it, I, I mean, over the years, I've, I've got a collection of wallpaper printing blocks. Oh, wow. uh, I've collected those over the years because they often used to come up and I wondered where they came from, but they used to come up in Wisbeach quite often in my auctions. Mm. Um, and, uh, and, and they're ever so interesting, um, but they're rarely dated or named or anything. So, yeah. but, but um, it's one of those ones that you might be able to kind of like, you know, find an example of somewhere else or kind of like help date them. But um, yeah, that's that's really, really fascinating. So, mm. yeah, no, it'd be great, great to sort of see those. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. I think if everyone's done with questions, we've uh, we've hit our we've hit seven o'clock, so we've hit our our time limit now. So uh, um, if no one has any other questions, then I'll um, I'll uh, sign us off. Could I, well, may I ask, ask one? Thanks for being so engaging. May, may I ask one one other one uh, for, sure, to Jamie? Do. Jamie, when when is with the next one of these excellent presentations? Because they're really good, and I, I'm 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 disappointed that not more people turn up, but. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, it's, it's, it's a shame. I, if, I, I think I understand they're recorded. So is there a, a way that I could tell, like, trustees of the Wisbeach Society so that they could tune into them? Because I'm surprised that more people don't come, really, but um, I don't know why. Yeah, um, so the next one, we haven't got a date yet, but hopefully that will be soon. So I will send out my usual email once we've got a date and a time booked in. So anyone that's already been before, you can know about it first. And we do have a YouTube channel. There's a, a link in the chat already, but we've got a few of the previous ones on there at the moment. So it's just a recording of the entire talk like you've seen it this evening. So once that's uploaded, I'll get the links out as well so that you can pass it on to yeah. the rest of the trustees. Oh, terrific. I mean, this will be a collector's um, edition because it's the first time anybody's seen me without a tie on. <laughs> <laughs> Screenshotting it now. Yeah. I've been doing things in my garden, so I didn't have time to put one on. So I apologise for that. But anyway, absolutely terrific. Thank you very much. And yeah, thanks everyone for, for being really engaging. And thanks so much for, for coming as well. And, and thanks, Jamie, as well, for, um, for organising and uh, giving giving these platforms to them as well. It's, it's such a great project. Oh, thank you. That was a really, really good one. Um, have a lovely evening, everybody. And thank you for being here. Thank, thank you. you so much. Bye, -bye. Bye, bye everyone. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, how do we go? Mm. Don't know which button I press now. Mm. Oh. There should be a big red one that says. Oh, is that me. you, Jamie? Yeah, sorry, I've just found a big red telephone. Yeah, thank you That's so it. much. Yeah, terrific. Take thank care. you so much. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. -bye.